Linux Luddites, episode 56, for the 4th of October, 2015. Hello and welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. And I'm Jesse. And on this show, we kick off with a grumble, uh, t- sorry, a review of OpenSUSE <laughs> Tumbleweed. We cover your feedback on our recent topics. And finally, we had the opportunity to talk to Rachel Romeliotis from O'Reilly Publishing about the upcoming OzCon 2015 in Amsterdam. And we have a fantastic giveaway to make on the back of that. Yeah, so stay tuned for that. So, as I said, we're starting off with Sousa, and uh, let's get on with that review. Now, this is something that you have been suggesting that we talk about for a long time, Jesse, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, which is the rolling release edition of OpenSUSE. It's never been met with huge enthusiasm from Paddy and me, uh, so justify why you wanted to talk about it. I kind of figured it's because... It's one of the bigger of the distros, you know, it's, it's always one that people mention in the same breath of, as things like Debian and Ubuntu, yet we do not really give it a lot of airtime, mostly, I guess, because it's KDE and RPM, so it's a double whammy of, of reasons not to use it. But it's also gone through some changes recently, so what was the factory sort of release, which was the cutting edge, and then what they were going to do was remove periodically uh packages from there and that would go into the tumbleweed and then they also had their sort of stable regular release cycle one which is called leap but more recently factory and tumbleweed have been merged together to make the one tumbleweed distribution so if you go to their website which i have to say is quite a sort of slick modern website has got two options either tumbleweed which is the fully rolling bleeding edge sort of packages or there's Leap, which is the periodic release, which is basically every 12 months it has a minor, and every three to four years it has a major release, both aligned with the SUSE Linux Enterprise releases. And so I thought, let's have a look at a rolling release, and, and let's have a look at Tumbleweed. Okay, well, I, that's what struck me first, was that Tumbleweed and Leap are given equal billing on the website. You go to opensuse.org, and it's just straight there, you know, which one do you want to look at? And I'm a bit surprised by that. I had assumed that Leap would be prominent and Tumbleweed would be kind of more for people who want to live on the the edge, as it were. And, you know, I I just didn't think they'd be given equal billing. And so I thought that you could therefore forgive it any little problems that it had. But given their equal billing, I think it's, it's fair game for all the criticism that I'm about to throw at it, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, it says that the Tumbleweed edition is for power users, software developers, and open SUSE contributors. So it does give you an idea that it's you know a little bit less stable. There may well be some problems, glitches here and there, but you have the benefit of getting not the very latest in an arch sense, I don't think, but certainly a lot more bleeding edge and cutting edge releases than you would get with maybe Debian or Ubuntu or Mint or what have you. So. I was interested to see what sort of packages it had and and how easy they were to install and and use. And I suppose there's also been changes to Yast and there's another sort of way that you can install packages rather than just using the RPM installers. There's like Appa and Zipper and various things going on in there. So it's just a bit of a different world. So I thought we'd have have a look and see if the little green chameleon can turn up trumps. Okay, well, I first of all, I decided to do a net install because I looked and it was like a DVD sized ISO, four and a half gigs or something, or a small net one. And I thought, mm, right, I'll just go for that. That'll be quicker. And I found it reasonably easy to install, sort of on a par with Debian, I would say, uh, rather than Ubuntu. It's kind of like a cross between the Debian installer and the Fedora installer. So not great, basically. Is that all sort of a N curses type thing then? Well, no, no, it's not N curses. It's it is fully graphical, but just the way it works. I, I suppose the Debian graphical installer is what I should have said. Just the with um, Ubiquity, 
it's just so easy with Ubuntu and derivatives thereof. And, you know, I'm kind of used to that level of um, just ease and how quick it is. Whereas this has a lot more complicated options. And so it kind of wouldn't work, I don't think, with a simple installer. Yeah, you can tell this has come from SUSE Linux Enterprise because, like you said, there are a lot of options. And just looking at the, the options for network cards and network setup, there are six different options. If you choose to go into the, the Advanced Features tab, there are six different options for when the wired network device should be activated. So that's from the start, when it's plugged in, don't do anything, from when it's first required, and there's a couple of other ones. You can also look at uh, what the IF plug D priority is. There's a hardware tab with all sorts of options to change UDEV rules and kernel modules and ETH tool options and a whole load of things which go beyond what I would know to do with networks and things. And even just setting up the wireless, I found the not as simple as you would think of search for wireless, press my password, and in we go. There was a few more uh, quirks and options here and there to allow you to do more complicated things. But you could also keep it fairly simple, as <laughs> as I did. Yeah, I mean, things like setting up static IPs and stuff, which, yeah, do feel very enterprise, uh, which... I suppose it makes sense given its relationship to a mainstream enterprise distro, but it didn't feel like what I'm used to. It didn't feel like a kind of home users distro at all. I mean, from the installer throughout, really. Yeah, it then goes through setting up the network once you've put the various options in, probes the system to look for the hardware. And then I quite like it gives you an option for whether you want to do any pre installed repos or add on products from separate media. So, If you maybe have software that you want to put in from USB or a CD, or you know there are going to be repositories that you're going to call when you start up from, you know, a sort of server or there's various things you always use on your desktop, you can get those added in at the install stage, which is something I haven't seen before. I thought it was quite a nice little feature. Yeah, and when you put your password in, there's options for level of encryption and hashing for that, which I thought was quite nice. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I mean, it starts off on the most strong one, so why I'd want to degrade it, I don't know. I also use a very simple password for testing these things, so I don't have to do anything long and complicated while I'm just going yep. through <laughs> test procedures. And so it's only like six characters long, and it says, are you sure you want to use this password? It's fairly insecure. And I was like, yeah, I'm an idiot, carry on. But it's nice that it does remind you that you should be trying to think of something more more complicated to keep things secure. Yeah, funnily enough, I've got that in my notes as well because I use quite a simple password for these test destroys. You just want something quick, don't you? You can bash in. Yeah, you spend the whole review time putting the same password in over and over again for various things and testing and installing and changing setup functions and things. So it's nice to have something that you don't have to spend a lot of time on. Yeah, but again, that feels very enterprise, doesn't it? It's it's kind of like with Ubuntu derivatives, it, it usually says fair password for my one and it's not a fair password. It's a very, very easy password whereas this it kind of warns you look that's not a good password are you really sure you want to do that so yeah again very enterprise like feature but but good nonetheless but let's let's get into the kind of negatives of the installer partitioning now if you want to give it your whole disk or just let it do what it wants including using btreefs for some reason and xfs and setting up a separate home partition and stuff then you're golden it's not a problem it will just do it perfectly but the minute you want to start dual booting or or setting it up as you want it with an ext4 and no swap in my case because i don't really have room on the disc for that then it just it's not much fun at all is it well i had a bit of problems i had two hard disks in my computer and i must have either been bleary and sleepy or it didn't pop up or something because i don't remember a partition i just got to the point where it said install and i thought well which disk is this going to be installed to i I can't run the risk of it picking the wrong disk so i stopped it all pulled the disk out physically and then carried on through and then the second time i came to the partitioner so i can only assume i somehow skipped over it but it's not the kind of thing you would want to skip it in an install but yeah i looked at it and it had oh a good dozen or so partitions for the btrefs type setup and i thought oh okay this is all that complicated stuff but it's a test laptop let's just nuke it and go for it um and so i ran through it fairly seamlessly just allowing it to do what it wanted so what were the problems you had with ext4 and things well you go into the expert partitioner 
And it's kind of got the partitions that it wants preset up. And then you have to delete partitions that don't exist yet and and then set it up as you want. And in the end, um, well, in the very end, I just wiped the whole disk. But I did have some partitions that I wanted to keep. I had a, a Ubuntu and a Debian installation that I wanted to keep on this test laptop. I mean, they, they are disposable partitions, ultimately. You know, that's why I have this test laptop and why I don't do these destroy reviews on my production machines. But I wanted to keep them around, and I just found it very difficult to do that. And in the end, I actually booted into a live uh, session of Ubuntu Mate and had a look in Gparted and kind of, uh, you know, looked to see wh- what was SDA 7 and whatever. And I didn't really trust the the partitioner in SUSE. So, uh, you know, I wasn't very happy with it. And the other thing was I installed it a couple of times and it didn't boot. There was no grub. And I was like, oh, okay, what's going on here? And then, uh, you know, I, I fixed it with boot repair but then I went in and thought, well, why is that? What is that problem caused by? And then it turns out that by default, it doesn't install the bootloader to the master boot record, which usually it asks you about, you know, do you want to do this? Has it picked up your uh, other operating systems, you know, in, in various other distros? Whereas here, it was just an option in a big list in the kind of final checklist that I overlooked a couple of times, which is a bit strange really you think it would give you that option because otherwise if you just follow all the defaults you get a system that's not bootable yeah no you mentioned it i looked at that in the summary as well and and realized before my install happened that i needed to change that but that summary list i quite like and it sort of shows you all of the things that you selected so whether you're doing a server install it might have things like samba shares and printer servers and another sort of mail servers and things or if you've selected kde it'll have the various kde applications and the kde desktop environment or gnome so just on that topic that the two that it sort of gives you straight out as options for DEs are KDE and GNOME. I think traditionally SUSE has been a, a KDE mainstream distro and it gives you other options for uh, XFCE, LXDE, a minimal X, and then some sort of super minimal server something or other that I thought was, what's, what's the difference between a minimal X install and a minimal server install? But they're, they're the, the desktop environments you can get. Well, that would just be no X, presumably. It would just be headless. You know, you just boot into it and you've just got command line, like a kind of uh, Debian install if you don't select the, a desktop environment. You just you get the base system from which then you can install whatever you want. And if you are running a server, then you wouldn't want X, would you? So that's probably what that was about. Oh, yeah, the same as you would with the Ubuntu server. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, okay, um, um, that makes some sense, yeah. And another problem I have with the installer is that it keeps talking about OpenSUSE 13.2. Now, th- this isn't 13.2, is it? I thought Tumbleweed didn't really have a number. 13.2 is the, the kind of fixed release. Yeah, exactly. So Leap would be the periodic release, which is the 13.2. And you're right, a rolling release doesn't really have a number. It may have, have a snapshot come out, but it's going to be a continually evolving thing that doesn't really have a, a, a stop point. So... I, I noticed that as well. There's a number of times when something said 13.2 and I thought, well, is this going to work because it's based off the same stuff and therefore has the same sort of back end and libraries and things? Or is it going to be a bit funny about the fact that it's not actually 13.2? And I think it was a 50-50, actually. I, I had a number of issues installing things that I'd taken from 13.2 when we got into the actual main release. Okay. So I went for KDE first and expecting Plasma 5, booted into it, and then there was kind of a welcome screen that had a link about KDE 4. I was like, oh, okay. And it kind of looked like KDE 4. I thought, oh, what's going on? Like, is it really? Is it really stuck on KDE 4? But then a bit of a dig around, and no, it is actually Plasma 5, but it's just kind of themed to look as much like KDE 4 as possible. Oh, I thought it was Plasma 5 from the off because it had all the sort of pastel colours and the light greys, and I recognised the the off switches and the, those icons and things. And I think some of the, the splash screens are quite Plasma 5. So I may well be not so familiar with KDE 4 as you are to be able to say which one's which, but from what I'd seen of Plasma 5 on other examples of KDE, 
I was fairly sure it was there, but you're right. It did have a thing that sort of said, let's look at KDE4. And I started with GNOME and then looked over at KDE. So so let's let's kick off with KDE as you have. And the, the thing that I sort of feel from having looked at both of them is that KDE is very much the focus, whereas GNOME is, and we have the other major desktop environment if you want it. So for example, that splash screen that you're talking about, which has information on OpenSUSE and things that you can do in KDE and, and ways of using it, that you'd have on, on Mint, for example, that has, has a similar sort of item there. You don't get that in GNOME. It's just been completely forgotten or left out. And you kind of think, well, it should be a fairly equivalent sort of thing. You should still get the same splash screen, the same help at the startup, but you just don't seem to. So that was an odd difference between those two desktop environments. Yeah, I didn't notice it at the time, but you're right. Yeah, the, there wasn't that kind of attention to detail with Gnome. But yeah, we'll get back into that. But I mean, I looked at Kubuntu 15.04 to kind of compare it. And the theming in Tumbleweed feels older and uglier, whereas Kubuntu feels like modern. I remember that was my first experience of Plasma 5, and I was really taken by how modern it is. Everything's flat, and, you know, like it or not, it, it is very kind of fashionable and modern, whereas Sousa feels old to me, even though it's Plasma 5. It feels just a bit dated. Yeah, my experience with KDE was from the Chaos, and they're on Plasma 5, and it's, they say, all the icons are flat, and it's got sort of, I, I get more of a pastel sort of feel when it comes to Plasma 5, and that's my sort of overview of it. But it has a, a more modern feel, a more graphically interesting sort of look. It, it's somehow swisher. And I have in my notes that I'm annoyed at the difference between some things being very, very good, which are clearly left as Plasma 5. Like I said, the the logout, the restart, the on-off buttons all have a very slick, minimalist feel. The shortcut to Firefox is a, a flat icon with sort of bold colours rather than lots and lots of different colours. A couple of bold colours is what I mean, rather than lots and lots of different colours that make up the standard Firefox icon. But then mm. next to it, there's you know a really sort of budget-looking Amarok logo or a very normal-looking sort of settings menu. Actually, that's a bad example because settings menu is a good one. But but they they are they are blurred into one, and there's no clear. These are all flat, new-looking icons, and or these are all old ones. There's a mix. And I think that's really where they start to fall down. And both KDE and GNOME please go and make a better icon set for your standard files and folders. Like the known one is the horrible brown one that's been around since like the 80s. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. And <laughs> KDE is those blue ones, which I also think look like ghastly. And I, I don't understand why they haven't got something that looks newer. There are so many better icon sets for just the files and folders. They, they just need to go and get something else, I think. But you're absolutely right. It isn't as slick as either Kubuntu or Chaos when you fully integrated Plasma 5. But I also found there was a lot of applications in KDE over GNOME. Did, did you find that as well? Yeah, I mean, you get kind of everything you'd be expecting with a KDE installation. There's also just... I felt a very large number. So compared to the GNOME install, which had uh, shot well to look at your photos and videos for playing videos and music, and then the open office, or I think it was LibreOffice, there wasn't a lot more. They had all the you know the sort of basic ones that you expect, but no unnecessary ones. Where whereas the KDE install had things like. GIMP and Gwenview and Hugin and Empty Paint and Panorama and Photo Layouts Editor and Show Photo and Simple Scan and Scanlight and View Noir. And that was just in the multimedia section of, you know, there are like three different ways of making a panoramic photo. And you think, okay, an unusual thing to include would be a way to make a panoramic photo. But to have three different options just seems a bit unnecessary. Yeah. I also found that KDE was a bit slow uh, it, i mean gnome was was not the most f slick thing ever but it was certainly i felt very peppy better than I, i'd found gnome previously whereas kde i found myself watching the little bouncing ball thing that allowed you to wait for whatever application it was and then every every now and then it just wouldn't open at all so i i don't know i, I just felt it was a frustrating experience waiting for stuff to happen and occasionally nothing happening so i sort of got a bit disheartened as to whether anything was actually going to happen when I when I opened stuff. 
Well, I think there's a serious danger of reviewing KDE rather than Sousa. And that's why I wanted to look at Kubuntu as well. And for me, yeah, KDE is is slow and resource heavy. That's just a given. But Kubuntu 15.04 felt quicker and slicker to me than Sousa did. And that's something I think we actually reviewed Sousa, I can't, it might have been 13.1 or way back, I think, in show two or something. And that was my complaint of it then, was that it was solid and worked well, but it was slower than other mainstream distributions. And I, I got that feel here as well, that it was subjectively slower than Kubuntu. I mean, you have experimented with uh, KDE a little bit recently. I mean, uh, is it just a KDE thing or is it a, a tumbleweed thing? Well, my experience with KDE, as I say, was with chaos. And at no point did I think it felt slow. So I'd therefore say it was a tumbleweed thing, sort of, of bringing down KDE somehow. But then on the flip side, like I said, with GNOME, I felt it was actually fairly slick. So maybe it's just a bad implementation or maybe, you know, QT isn't running so nicely on top of Tumbleweed or something or other. But somehow that KDE Tumbleweed pairing isn't as good as either the GNOME Tumbleweed or KDE with a different uh, base on it. So disappointing given that, as I say, I think it's generally seen as their sort of their principal um, desktop environment. But how did you do with installing things? Because there's a number of different ways you can do this, isn't there? Well, I just used Yast and didn't have any problems, really. I mean, I had some problems with updates because it was uh, looking for the installation medium like Debian tends to do. And so I had to go in and uh, remove that. Um, But once I'd done that, it was all fine. It actually downloaded updates during the installation, so there weren't any available. But doing software installation, just search for it, stuff came up, installed it. I mean, I found that it was lacking a few things that I was looking for. There was no INXI, for example, but uh, the stuff that was there installed perfectly well. So I I didn't feel that I needed to really progress much beyond Yast. Okay, why was I using Zipper? I don't know. Okay, so I have a little crib sheet that I uh, leave in my drawer and it has all the different distributions and the the package managers and the known ways of installing things. So, there's, you know, what would you say for update? What would you say for refreshing your repositories, searching the packages and things like this? So I just looked at that crib sheet and it says zipper is the way you do it. So that's what I did. And at no point did it occur to me that I should be using something else. Okay, well, my experience with OpenSUSE is that Yast is pretty much a catch-all for anything you want to do when it comes to software, be it updates or installation or removal. So that's just my go-to. I just searched for Yast, found it, did the job. Yeah, okay. I mean, Yast did pop up a lot for me. I mean, every time you open something from like the sort of administrator tab to change some real core settings of the system, more often than not, Yast would pop up and it would go to one of the specific sections of Yast and, and try to make you do something. And I'm right in saying that Yast is a bit more like Synaptic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of like Synaptic, but with more features. Okay, yeah. So I was doing it from the command line and, and using this zipper, which I thought was fairly slick um, for, for a command line application. And it had um, a progress bar for each of the downloads, which I don't think apt-get has, which is my, my sort of go-to way of doing things. But I, I decided that I'd play an MP3, and unsurprisingly, it didn't allow you to play them because it needed to get the the codex. So I went online and just typed in SUSE MP3 and it says, here's a one-click install from the SUSE website for getting these to work. So when you click on that, it takes you to Yast and then it adds repositories automatically and then updates those and then installs the things you want to use, which I think is quite slick because... Like I say, it goes through the the two stages of you're going to need these repositories, which we haven't given you, and then we can update and get them, and then you can use it. And and it worked out fairly well. However, when I was using GNOME, I was annoyed by the fact that you don't have a minimize button on the the Windows, which is just a GNOME stupidity. And so I looked at using GNOME Tweak Tool and installing that, and I had some real problems. So when I searched online for GNOME Tweak Tool, there was a website fr- within SUSE which says to install it, you need to do either select the 64-bit or 32-bit or do the one-click install. And this is all within the sort of tumbleweed option rather than the 13.2 option. 
And within Tumbleweed, it gives you one version, and you can look at alternative download locations, which adds more repositories. And if you do the one-click install, it downloads a YPM file, which Yast opens and then does as I explained. But if you do the 64-bit one, it downloads an RPM and then opens APA, which is the, the graphical installer for RPM packages. And so it's got these sort of two different ways of doing it, and that's not even thinking about the command line. I, it was just a little bit sort of odd, and, and with the main download clickable button for, in theory, any version of OpenSUSE, it wouldn't auto-download from Chrome. You, it just showed you the, the code that was there, so I could only do it from Firefox. And then when I looked at the Tumbleweed version, it had an older release of GNOME Tweak Tool than it did for the sort of main click, and I thought, well, surely the Tumbleweed version should be at least the newest, if not, if not newer. So... It was a little bit odd that Tumbleweed wasn't as... It didn't seem to be as cutting edge as, as I thought it would have been. Yeah, and I was kind of half expecting to see the new GNOME 3.18, but it was it was stuck on 3.16. something. So that was a bit of a surprise as well. That yet, uh, you know, you've got things like LibreOffice 5, which are the very latest, or at least close to the very latest, certainly the, the latest major release, Whereas even on things like Manjaro, you're still stuck on four point something. So yeah, it's it's a bit inconsistent, isn't it, with um with what is the latest and what is a little bit behind. Agreed. And there was something else that I wanted to install. I can't quite remember what it was now. And there was one of these one click download installs, which I was quite quite fond of, but they hardly ever worked. I had real problems. So I think stage one is installing the repos and it tried to install some repos for the factory, but as we've discussed earlier, factory and Tumbleweed are now one, so I was a little bit unsure, and after it does the check as to whether the repos are there, it failed and couldn't install the thing I wanted. And then another one I looked at, it was trying to install ARM repositories, which again, can't be right, so it failed and, and I had to go back. So ultimately I found that actually just finding the RPM and installing it that way, either with Zipper on the command line or with Appa on the GUI, w- was a, an easier way. And I have to say, those are sort of the real, I think, key open SUSE parts. A lot of my other notes are, are GNOME-related or KDE-related, which we've either covered or aren't really sort of pertinent here. So are there any other sort of major points on open SUSE you wanted to, to just get off your chest, Joe? Well, before I complain a little bit more, a bit of a question. Were you looking just at random places online for these, uh, these repos that you were adding, or, or was it somewhere official? Oh yeah, like had I been just finding John's random distro repo edition portal, then I wouldn't have been complaining quite so much. But these are from the OpenSUSE portal, which is their sort of documentation location, a sort of a wiki, or from OpenSUSE.org. So they're places where you're getting the official, you know, tweak tool or um, Flash or whatever it is that I was trying to install. So it's it's somewhere I'd expect it to have worked. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I was going to say that, uh, you know, that's not really a valid criticism, but it sounds like it is actually. So, I mean, you said Flash there, that was actually installed by default. I went to iPlayer and it played no problem and checked and yeah, it was using Flash. Um, but then other multimedia stuff, I tried at one point to play a video and it said that it didn't have the codecs installed. Do you want me to go and get them for you? I said, yes. And then it failed, which I'm so used to happening that it's a surprise when it does happen. And I think I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, that, that I'd had a pleasant experience with it. So no surprise there at all. So I thought, okay, well, good old VLC, installed that, tried to play the video, missing codecs. And that's the second time ever that I've had that in VLC, where there were codecs not found. I mean, I can only assume that it's some sort of legal situation. I know that Sousa is very kind of serious enterprise. So that would make sense that they, they don't want to get in trouble for shipping codecs. So mm, yeah, that's a bit of a fail really multimedia wise. It means serious digging around. Usually it's a case of uh, it try and install the codecs or just resort to VLC. It's got everything it needs. It plays it. And so this is just a he- headache for me, which again, isn't a real surprise for me. I mean, kind of in conclusion here, this does feel very enterprise, and so they wouldn't really care about things like multimedia playback because that's generally not a huge thing in the enterprise space. But 
at the same time, the question that I have for this is, what's the point of being so up to date if the system's unstable? And I found that certainly with the GNOME version, it was just pretty ropey and unstable. Things would crash quite a lot. And, you know, it's to be expected, I suppose, a bit of instability with being uh, on the bleeding edge. But, you know, it, it doesn't seem hugely ahead of, say, Manjaro. I mean, Arch is, like, really on the bleeding edge. Manjaro lags a little bit behind it. But if you want the latest versions of things, Manjaro I find to be very stable, whereas this I, I just didn't feel was stable at all and just generally it had quite a ropey feeling to it, like it was kind of thrown together. And, you know, I would forgive it if it was like a community version or something, or if it was, you know, you had to scroll right down the page to find a link to it. But given that it's their top billing, equal billing with the, the, the main version or what I consider to be the main version, I find it very strange that it's, it is so unstable. And I, I think that I, I feel justified in criticizing it that, I mean, there's basically no way I would ever use this because it, it just, I mean, it's not just because it's different because I, I feel that I could use the standard version of SUSE or at least 13.1 that I tried. I haven't fully tried 13.2, but there was just no way I would use this on my system because it, it just, there are too many problems with it. Yeah, I certainly found a lot of times I installed something and then tried to run it. And like I said, the little the little bouncy icon that shows that application is loading would happen. And I think 50% of the time, it just sort of fizzled out. And I wasn't really sure why that happened or what the result was, which which I didn't find happened so much on the GNOME install, which is, which is odd. So yeah, generally, not something I see much need. And if they're they're not at the bleeding edge. If it's bleeding edge and unstable, you accept it. If it's not quite at the bleeding edge, you'd expect it to be a bit more stable and, and working. So, I mean, the kernel, for example, is 416, but the current latest stable kernel is 421. So they're not even at that cutting edge. So I, I agree. I'm, I'm not quite sure who this is, is aimed at or where it's benefiting. Yeah, it seems to be aimed at people who are SUSE users who want to test things you know it's it's kind of like if you're a red hat user you use fedora to test what's coming up but if, in terms of everyday use f- forget about it I, I would never use this based on this experience i'm afraid yeah and even if it was stable i've seen better kde implementations so i wouldn't even suggest it from that point of view well it looks like a bit of a thumbs down from us so i suppose we'll better move on to the feedback First of all, then, a huge thanks to Marshall Mason for your PayPal donation and to our new monthly supporters, Jezra and Ian Kelling, and, of course, to our existing monthly supporters, and on Flatter, Marmai, and Rolf Rees Bjornsson, I think you say that. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Very much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely, for keeping our servers and making sure the website stays up and things completely vital. So thanks for your support. And also thanks to Ian Kelling for your Bitcoin donation. Now, that's the question that I've got for the rest of the audience. Is it worth us putting the Bitcoin address back on the website? Um, Let us know. So if you want to contact us, you can either email show at linuxloadouts.com or find us on Twitter, Facebook, or Google+, or leave a comment on the website. So we start off with some feedback on Flavio Tordini's apps, which were the three applications for looking at YouTube in, in different ways. And Steve Leach on Facebook questioned our use of app to describe these and wondered if it was an interchangeable for software on our PCs in the UK or if it's mainly for phones. And I think it's got to the point where apps on phones and the fact that on the PC we sort of started to call them applications and it just becomes a sort of segues into one and, and apps. And his point was that he was expecting us to be reviewing phone apps but now, in fact, we reviewed PC programs, so it was a little bit confused as to where we're coming from. Yeah, I mean, I don't like the word app at all, generally. I mean, it's short for application, and, you know, that is, I suppose, what it is. It, it, it's a piece of software, whether you call that an application, a program, or an app. I mean, they're all synonyms, really. But, um, yeah, I, I can take the point that it is a bit confusing sometimes. But uh, Paddy wrote the introduction that said app. I would have probably said program. I don't know. Paddy wants to be down with the kids. You can't blame him while he's not here. He can't defend (laughs) himself. Yeah, throw him under the bus while he's not here. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, Ivor O'Connor said, I used to use Minitube. I liked how it removed the adverts, but it's always been very buggy and pricklish. Seemed like the finishing touches, some of which you've noticed, were missing. Then Minitube quit working altogether on Linux for the longest time. Something to do with the YouTube API requiring keys. So I was intrigued when you guys reviewed it. So I reinstalled it and was delighted it works. However, it no longer downloads YouTube videos. I believe you used to be able to press Control S to do that. Now it's gone. Since I use my cell phone's tethering, I like to minimize bandwidth. And so I'm forced to use something else besides Minitube, which allows me to download the videos. Strangely enough, most of those downloading browser plugins only work on Firefox. Chrome seems to actively sabotage the plugins fairly quickly so that it complies with their views on YouTube usage. But they fortunately don't control Firefox. You guys might want to do an episode on Firefox plugins for YouTube as a follow-up to this Minitube review for those of us who want more freedom. Well, YouTube DL is what I use these days. I occasionally use browser plugins, but generally not. It's, it's just much easier to fire up a terminal and use YouTube-DL and then the URL, and then it downloads it in the best available quality. Never 1080p, which is a little bit annoying sometimes, but um, 720 generally, which is usually good enough for a YouTube video. Yeah, YouTube downloader is something that Floyd Wallace mentioned on our website. So going on to the, the discussion between old versus new software, Keith said G wrote in to say, I think Jesse was on the right track mentioning the ironing out of bugs and addition of features. Right now I'm loving Kubuntu 15.04 and Plasma 5 on my wonderful gaming machine at home, but at work I'm sticking with Plasma 4 and the underlying 14.04 base for the sake of stability and certain as not yet re-implemented features, for example grouping arbitrary windows into tabs. Meanwhile, I'm running Ubuntu Wiley and Arch on my own new Chromebook Flip, and they're snazzy and new but crashy as hell, as one would expect. Or I can boot back over into Chrome OS and it's simple and limited but completely stable. So I think there's a continuum. For getting work done, stability and maturity is king. For gaming and the other such leisures, it's nice to have the latest and greatest, especially for the sake of drivers and for impressing Windows users with how snazzy the Linux thing looks. For tinkering for tinkering's sake, and to see what's over the horizon, the bleeding edge is fun. And I was pleased to see that Helam Serene on Google Plus got in touch also with a similar point of view, saying... I think Jesse nailed it on the question of why the old stuff is better. I should point out at this point myself that I put the feedback together, so it's maybe no coincidence. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering why there was so much of this, but yeah, carry on. <laughs> she says, I was an early adopter of Ubuntu Mate, and even though it is a new project, I still categorize it as the old stuff. It's all about maturity and software. Older software has the advantage of being heavily used tested by a large install base that allows not only for the elimination of bugs, but refinement of user experience based on user feedback over a long development period. Unity for me was unstable when I adopted it in 2011, but many users now say that it's a very nice desktop user experience and it's being used on other platforms like Arch. Innovation and duplication of effort is always what makes open software work. Projects may fail or they may mature, and always the good things will be refined and adopted by others. TLP and Mate menu are examples of this that occurred to me as an Ubuntu Mate user. The Mint team adopted Mate Desktop for a spin of their distro, and the work was done to integrate the mature and popular Mint menu with Mate. Because of that work, the Mate menu was able to be forked and included in Mate Desktop. Whether now, 10 years from now, or more, mature software will always be more stable, less buggy, and have a better user experience than the new and shiny stuff. Good software requires a lot of testing, fixing, and refinement. It's really that simple. Yeah, I can't argue with that at all. Makes sense. So on the topic of Chromixium, Aaron B outlined how Chromixium had improved the laptop his wife used, so that's nice to hear. And Martin Wimpress asked, after hearing your first impression of Chromixium, I wonder if you'd all give Chromium OS a look. While Chromixium is a close approximation to Chrome OS, Chromium OS is a real boy Chrome OS. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on how Chromium OS compares to a Chromebook and also what Paddy makes of it, having never used Chrome OS before. Yeah, well, it feels a bit too soon to do it again because it'd be a bit similar. But um, yeah, maybe in a few months we uh, we might go back to it. And um, yeah, it's on my massive list of things to have a look at because I was aware of it vaguely, but I thought it wasn't very mature and didn't work very well. But it sounds like Martin's uh, recommended it. So yeah, I'll have to check it out. 
Or maybe he doesn't want to install it on one of his laptops and go through the hard work of getting it to work. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Well, we covered the topic of paywalls and how people should be paying for the content they use on the web. And Jodie Mack wrote in, and she pointed us towards an alternative to website paywalls, which was an Indiegogo campaign, which has now finished and didn't actually get funded. But it's an interesting thought in a way that you'd be able to pay the creators of software and content online. Um, so if, if you have a, a five minutes, go and look at the video on Indiegogo. We'll put the link in the show notes. And it's an interesting thought. But Alex wrote in to say... I think the concern from Paddy that one large company is controlling news is quite valid, and I share that concern too. I think a solution would be some sort of double-blind administration. In this scenario, one company, say the news outlet, would figure out how much content you read or view on their site. They could then send the appropriate numbered units, megabytes, numbers of articles, whatever, to the subscription company, who would then charge you a monthly or annual fee. With this setup, the news outlet say BBC, knows what you're reading on their site perhaps, but at least the subscription company, Google, Amazon, whoever, doesn't know all of what you're reading. They only know how much, which is the only data they need to determine what fee you should pay for their service. It may also eliminate the large company from being a target for cybersecurity threats because they wouldn't have large amounts of identifying information about you. This sort of model may even make the need for ad blockers obsolete if enough people bought into the service. Which I think is an interesting thought as to how you'd do it, because our big concern was the idea that you'd end up with a, a single sort of umbrella monopoly like Google or Amazon or someone, knowing all the sites you go to, and all that does is fuel their ability to to sell ads and, and promote themselves, basically, even though you're using all of the, the websites that you're going to view and read. So having this double-blind system does seem to make a bit more sense, but I still don't think that Google or Amazon are the people that you really want knowing any information about who's going to what websites or anything. So so perhaps the websites need to sign up with their government, but again, that is fraught with worry and, and things. So there needs to be some sort of somehow independent party involved somewhere. Sounds like a job for the Linux Foundation to me. Oh, yeah, they've only got a couple of things going on at the moment. So yeah, why, <laughs> yeah. why not? <laughs> Brian Aykroyd said, a collective micropayment system is okay. You could always have a pay-as-you-go system where you pay X amount per article with a monthly cap of, say, £13 and a fixed amount option of, say, £10. Personally, I detest adverts. I never watch any on TV because I rarely watch live TV, apart from the news, and if watching ITV player, etc., I go out of the room or switch the sound off and read whilst they're on. That's a nice technique. <laughs> yeah, I never click on ads, and I I don't want to encourage them. I'm a staunch BBC supporter, and I don't want to see any change or any further fines given out by the government. Yes, that's quite an apt thing at the moment in the UK, is that the Conservative government are sort of looking at the way the BBC work and looking at our licence fee that we pay and whether they've sort of overstretched their reach and are trying to compete with the private companies who have sort of ITV and, and Channel 4 and things. And... I have to say I agree with Brian that I nearly watch all my stuff on BBC. I think they have some of the best content and there's no adverts. And it annoys me when the thing I want to watch on 4, which is going to be on 4OD inevitably because I'm never on time, is I have to sit through three adverts before it starts and then there's another two adverts halfway through and exactly what he's saying. I will get to the point where I turn it on, carry on doing my cooking and then come back into the room and pause it when I know it's about to start and then serve up and and off you go sort of thing. So it's just one of those things that we all have our little ways around the annoying adverts and if there was a better way of of funding them, they wouldn't need them. But I think TV is very much ingrained in the the advert culture so it's never going to go away, is it? Yeah. And finally, on the on the topic of payments and things, Floyd Wallace wrote in saying, paying for access to discussions and knowledge bases for non-registered users who do not contribute is one intriguing model. For example, Reddit has a wealth of knowledge about all sorts of things, useful things that people would like to know. And I would pay a nominal sum to get access to it if they reached the search results by Google or Bing, rather than monetize the discussions by advertising against a rowdy crew, which was Ellen Powell's mistake. Pay to see the results is a good model as long as it's cheap enough and those who generate the knowledge base don't have to pay. Now, the problem I have with this idea is that how many times have you done a Google search, found the link that you know is going to answer the question or bring you the information you need, and then you realise that once you've clicked on it, it's not 
what you wanted to see at all or they've just got it wrong or you've already tried that and it's not gone right so you need another option and so if you're paying by clicking on links and going to reddit or whatever other site that holds the information how do you know that that's actually going to be useful you'd be very very worried before you click the links so there needs to be some better way of of explaining or maybe I know that Reddit votes up and votes down, so you have sort of a an internal system for making sure that the answers you're getting are good. But but I'm still a bit concerned that when I search for stuff, I find myself going to like five or ten different places before I find the exact answer or solution I'm looking for. So I'm not I'm not so sure about that solution. Yeah, I think it's a very tricky subject, and we, we've only really scratched the surface. And people have got some ideas, but it just seems that no one has hit on the the perfect one yet and maybe there is no perfect idea maybe we'll just kind of continue on with a a combination of a bit of advertising a bit of product placement and uh, you know some paywalls some micro payments i can't see one simple answer to it because it's a very complicated problem and uh, there's just no simple solution absolutely and it might all be one of those things where the solution could work in theory but unless everyone signed up to it both content producers and the people who you know hold that information and you know the servers and things and the the people who want to get that information all sign up at once to the same solution it won't work and I, I think the problem is that you're not going to get that kind of all-encompassing joint method unlike we've seen in germany which seems to have worked somehow which lucky them but um or maybe well organize them but it's <laughs> it's a case of it's a case of at the moment there's lots of little disparate groups all trying to do different things and i i can't see a a homogeneous kind of way of getting around it yeah well speaking of germany alan kearns lynn mob and florian all got in touch regarding the topic of free speech in germany um on on the back of the subject of facebook's um policy and kind of working with the government there and uh, we don't really want to go too much further into it here. I mean, we're kind of supposed to be a Linux and tech show, not uh, not politics and stuff. But uh, thanks for getting in touch. I might discuss it at length on the uh, Joe Rest podcast, perhaps. So, uh, yeah, look out for a future one of those. Cha-ching, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, cha-ching. <laughs> So a few odds and ends then. The first one is Steam. And Nathan D. Smith got in touch and said, now let's not be so quick to dismiss Jesse's prediction. Oh yeah, I wonder why this is in the feedback. (laughs) (laughs) I believe it was worded such that the top X games in Steam would have Linux ports, which is not the same thing as comparing the relative sizes of the user bases. Maybe Jesse was a bit optimistic, but with the Steam platform on Linux and the increase of cross-platform toolkits for game devs, Linux's share could only go up. If Linux becomes a superior platform for gaming, that will drive adoption. I don't see concern for free software making much of an impact. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Nathan. If games perform better in Linux, then gamers will switch. Because from my understanding of it, I don't play games, but my understanding is it's all about the frame rate and the quality settings. And if the game performs better on the same hardware with a different operating system, then gamers will make the switch because they just want to play their game as well as it can play. And they don't care about free software because most people don't. So, yeah, it it will just be a kind of happy byproduct that they're playing it on uh, an open source platform, uh, you know, at least the operating system, although Steam's proprietary anyway. So if you're going to use a big hunking piece of proprietary software like that, what difference does it make? I suppose the convenience of not having to have two OSs. Apart from that, it's not really a kind of software freedom issue. Yeah, I do have to wonder though. It's one thing for you know your your avid gamer to upgrade their hardware or buy a new game and install it. They're they're already basing it on things they know. Whereas to say, oh by the way, those two games out of your set of five or ten that you play have a slightly higher frame rate on Linux. You should therefore install Linux and install those two on there. It would seem like a bit of an upheaval to do that. So I wonder, you know, where the tipping point would get. Maybe only the very nerdiest or the most elite gamers would want that. But I, I don't think the average guy is going to say, well, 
let's install this entire operating system and try and work out how it works and have a separate partition and everything just with Steam on it because, okay, I can up my settings. And I, I know that, you know, from my point of view as well, having the best resolution and the slickest frame weight is, is everything you need, but it's quite a big step to install a second operating system that you've maybe never used just to get those things. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'd have to be all of the games on Steam and all of the other games as well. So uh, I suppose I'm ultimately quite pessimistic, as usual, about it. I I just think that while Windows 10 isn't a horrible operating system to use, people are going to use it because everything is available for it, whereas some stuff's available for Linux, more games than before are available. But you're right. All it takes is one game to not be available, and they're not going to use it. I mean, there's, there's someone I know who plays one game that isn't available, doesn't work with Wine, and so he's not really interested in using Linux. If he could play that on there, then maybe he would, but there'll probably be another game come along that's only available for Windows. So, yeah, I I think that, as usual, it's just people being a bit too optimistic, and, you know, you can tout numbers like 1,500 games are now available, but but it only takes one to not be available to keep people on Windows. Yeah, absolutely. Although there are still a few months left for my predictions to come true, so I'm I'm fingers crossed... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we also covered the topic of file syncing and PyPy wrote onto the website saying, I'm using Unison for two-way sync, which I don't think you've mentioned. It's self-contained, configurable, and seems to work well enough. And this is a point that Reint backed up saying, I just listened to the show and was eager to hear about more ways of bi-directional syncing. Very disappointed by the result though, you missed Unison. Like PyPy mentioned, it's self-contained, highly configurable, but is also multi-platform. It has a CLI and a GUI, works with SSH, cron, etc. It still uses rsync though, but what's wrong with rsync? Yeah, so it sounds like Unison may well have the various features that Paddy and I were looking for when it came to these syncing applications, because having a command line is essential for running scripts, having a GUI is sometimes nice, so it's something I think we need to have a look at. It it sounds like uh, a possibility which somehow the expert of Paddy didn't come across, so we have to go back and have a look at that. And Matthew Beaven got in touch to say that he'd asked the developers of the Minecraft project if the server code would be open source as well, and thought their response might be useful to our coverage of the subject. So Joshua Montgomery from Minecraft replied to Matthew and said, We are working to open source the entire stack. At first, we will be using some third-party APIs, but we're actively working on changing out the back end with an open source solution that we will share with the community once we have completed. Mm, sounds a bit vague to me. Yeah, I'm surprised that it wasn't all open source. All the coverage that I've heard is that everything is open source, everything is open, here's all the code, isn't everything great? As the first sort of slight fly in the ointment, don't get me wrong, it you know, everything else they're doing seems to be seems to be fairly uh well thought out with the pie and everything. But we'll we'll see if it does, as you say, come to fruition that they're able to open source it eventually. And uh only time will tell. Yeah, and my understanding is that you don't have to use the, their back-end server stuff. You can point it at your own local server running whatever you want. So I don't think it's absolutely essential, but it would be nice if they could open source that aspect of it and make it completely. But uh, yeah, here's hoping. If you check out the comments on episode 53, you'll see that Rob Landley wrote a fairly long post about the history of Microsoft and its antitrust trials and things. Yeah, and as usual, Rob, being a computer historian, has uh, kind of dug up some quite interesting links about that. And there's a lot more to that story than I had previously understood. So thanks a lot for that, Rob. And uh, yeah, do check that out. So that's it for the feedback then. Let's move on to the interview. We're now joined by Rachel Romeliotis, who is the co-chair of OzCon, an open source conference put on by O'Reilly Media. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Ah, it's good to have you. So to start off with then, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your role at O'Reilly? Sure. I uh, have the privilege of being a chair with OzCon. 
Uh, it's an open source convention that's been going on for, I believe this is the 18th year. I always forget exactly. Uh, this is the 18th year, and it's a conference that came about right after the open source movement really started, and I believe has been a place where it's been able to grow and uh, blossom over time to the point where open source is kind of the de facto standard nowadays. So so I get to be the, the program chair at that. I also run the um, editorial group that puts together a lot of the, the programming and software engineering and software architecture content at O'Reilly. Okay, and so that, that sort of where you are with O'Reilly, and how did you sort of uh, get to this role? What was your, what was your background that, that led you towards your sort of open source side? Sure. Uh, you know, I have been doing uh, technical publishing for, I guess, a little over 10 years now. Started actually more on the uh, electrical engineering side of things. And it's funny to think back, even optical engineering, where I barely understood what was happening. But uh, kind of found my way over to um, computing via InfoSec, and then got more over into the the, the programming languages and the best practices, um, but always on uh, you know a media and book and acquisition side. Uh, so I've been able to peer in on a lot of different areas of programming. It's been really interesting. Okay, so OSCON started as you said um, in the kind of late '90s in California, and it's mostly been held in Portland, Oregon. But uh, we've got you on to talk about the one that's happening in Amsterdam. Is that the first time it's been held in Europe then? So there was an OSCON Europe edition, I believe in 2008. So we're back again. And it's been a few years. Um, We wanted to come over to Europe because the open source story is a global one in that um, like I said, it is a de facto standard for everyone. But then there's uh, there's interesting things that people are doing with with open source all over the world, and and certainly Europe is somewhere that was early to open source. And, you know, we're finding a lot of cases where startups are using it in Europe, governments using it in Europe, and we basically wanted to hear, uh, you know, voices from Europe, and what they're doing. So, I would say that OzCon Amsterdam is a mix of sort of best of what's happened in uh, OzCon uh, North America the past couple of years, and then half uh, people from Europe and and what they've been doing and best practices and and, uh, new communities uh, in Europe. I get you, right, I see. So just to sort of paint a picture of sort of what happens at at a general OzCon. So this is a convention. So is there is there a particularly large convention floor and you also have talks or is it mostly talks or, you know, where does the balance lie between those two? So at OzCon Amsterdam, we have two days of sessions. I think there's 44, 48 sessions in total. And those sessions range from data to performance to collaboration and fundamentals. Then we have one day of workshops. We have a couple of one day workshops, one on Swift and one on software uh, architecture fundamentals. And then we have a few half day workshops on um, Kubernetes, I believe we have one on. And then we have switching over to cloud applications. So, and a couple other ones. So it goes from, you know, dipping a toe in the water as far as the sessions go, those are about 50 minutes. And then the workshops where you can actually learn stuff that you can go back to work, you know, a few days later and implement. And then we do have the expo hall happening the entire time. And we have a a bunch of people there that um, are doing some really cool things in open source. And we we have a a hardware showcase, which will be obviously showcasing some really great open hardware stuff, which is, is great that that's happening now. And some innovators as well. So it sounds more like it's to do with the talks and the training over the fact that you've got this this floor space with people's stools and, and demonstrations going on. It's definitely focused on the sessions. One thing I will say, though, is that people always leave OzCon having said, you know, sometimes the best session was the hallway session the hallway track, if you will. And and Mm -hmm. it's a great place because it is so diverse to talk to some, you know, I always like to think about someone uh, talking to uh, a COBOL person who is talking to someone uh, that uses Rust and and thinking about what could they learn from each other back and forth. Um, You know, same if someone's doing some major piece of architecture, talking to someone who's doing a mobile application, just kind of getting out of your 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 safety zone and and thinking outside the box i think is great yeah absolutely yeah so how important is the social aspect to it you know are there kind of drinks in the evening and you know does it go beyond the daytime stuff 
Yeah, so we're going to have a hackathon one of the evenings. Uh, we have Ignite, which is something we put together where I think there's maybe eight to ten five-minute uh, sessions where people have to advance their slides every, I want to say every 20 seconds. Uh, so that's really fun and gets people talking. And then we thought Amsterdam's super cool, so let's let people make their own choices about what they want to do in the evening. Okay, and is it possible that you can touch on a couple of the keynote speakers that are going to be there, or maybe some of the sessions that you have your eye on personally? Yeah, sure. So let me let me start by telling you a little bit about the session. So I was looking at it, and you know, we, like I said, it's it's very diverse, but there are some sort of threads that move through it. One of them is the idea of engineers that all of a sudden have been thrust into management and don't necessarily have any management background. Um, Generally, people that that happens to, it happens for a reason. They've made good judgments before, but there's a lot to learn. Uh, you know, I became a manager a couple of years ago, and, and frankly, like every day something happens where I'm like, oh, man, how, how do I do that? <laughs> then I figure yeah. it out. So <laughs> yeah. we have um, a few uh, sessions that are going through this. One is about um, fear of failing fast, how to actually, you know, make decisions and and try things and try them anew. And if you fail, that's totally fine. Um, the whole idea of the new workflows where it's like all about GitHub and pull requests, stuff like that. Transitions, dealing with transitions. You know, there's always uh, new projects that are starting up. There's old code out there that you need to go and revisit and change up or not. And then, um, and then also, like you said, you know, are you part of an incubator? Are you part of a bigger team? What where do you fit? Where does your engineering team fit in the larger in the larger company? So we've got a whole flow of of content going there. And then on the on the keynotes, actually, I think it's really cool. We have again, it's it's a wide it's a wide array of of content. We go anywhere. We have some growth hacking stuff. We're talking about sort of how corporations have gotten into and how they're influencing open source, which is really cool. We're actually doing some live coding with Sonic Pi. We're talking about Docker security. Everybody can't get enough of Docker. And then, you know, you got to think, okay, is it safe? Uh, so now that we're all on there, we have to figure out what's going on there. Um, talking a little bit about work-life balance. Uh, we're talking about A-B testing, basically. Uh, we have someone from uh, Booking.com, Stuart Frisbee. He's going to talk about, you know, they do a lot of these these tests, which, you know, decide, is this user interface better or worse, better or worse? And, and I think a lot of them end up being worse. And so, but they learn from it, you know what I mean? And they're constantly iterating. And then the idea of how do you start an open source business from the ground up? Like when you're a startup, why choose open source? How does that help you? How do you maintain that? So a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, by the sounds of it, yeah. Yeah, it sounds very diverse, not just kind of developers. It's, there's um, kind of more to it than that. You know, you mentioned the management stuff. So that that's a bit of a surprise to me. That's, uh, yeah, that makes it a lot more interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that developers are a lot more diverse. I mean, I think that... You know, it used to be that maybe the, you know, the software engineering team was sort of off in the corner, did projects, got them done. But now it's it's really a very big part of, I would say, almost all businesses. And so it's more than that. You know what I mean? Obviously, you're going to spend a certain amount of your time coding. But, um, but yeah, you know, how do you message what you're doing to the larger company? How does it impact the bottom line? So I think it's kind of a cool time to be a developer. I know you talked about the bottom line there and I saw on your website mm -hmm. there's a piece that says uh, how to convince your manager and I'm wondering yes. if, I'm wondering if this is because it's difficult to sort of get a tangible answer as to how you can sort of justify going and you've had to maybe find this a problem in the past or, or you know is, is this something that is becoming more and more known that open source is running more and more things and managers are you're finding they're more sort of accommodating for for allowing their their workers to go but it was just this convince your manager section do you find that's entirely necessary well i think it depends on the person i think that we want to you know anytime you want to convince your manager to go somewhere myself included you have to let them know why uh you know and i think that we want to make it easy for people to communicate that to their management i think that you know if you work in a company where open source is not used I would think that 
there are a multitude of reasons you could tell your management why you would want to come to OzCon because it does, it is sort of that survey of what's happening there. And you can get a lot of insight into talking to people that, you know, either have been in your position or are still in your position. So I think that's one thing. Then if you are using open source, I think that there's always stuff to be learned either about the community, how to work with the community, or say, uh, you know, you're using something, um, right now, and you want to switch to something else, a different framework, you're using Angular JS, you want to switch to React JS. I think, you know, that could turn into both changing to open source or changing a framework or whatnot could, you know, end up saving a lot of money in the long run and sort of it's, it's investment in, in your employees. So I think it's good just to have these little snippets to be able to, to be able to put it uh, succinctly to your manager. Okay, so in terms of the the pricing for it, there's different um, pass levels, I noticed. Yes. Could you explain those briefly? Yeah, so there's, uh, from what I know, there are, you can go the two days, which is the Monday and the Tuesday, which are the two sessions, uh, the two days of sessions, I should say. So you can go those two days, and then you can also go three days, which includes a full day of tutorials. And so uh, that's either a, a full day tutorial, the two that are the Swift and the software architecture fundamentals, or there's two half day. Um, so those are the two I believe that we have. Then there's a final pass where you get all access and you also get uh, a video compilation of everything that happened uh, at the event. And you get um, our Safari online library for three months. Okay, so everything gets filmed then? It does, yeah, definitely. Okay, that's good. And are people able to access those films that haven't been able to get to the conference? So anybody that has Safari Online Library will be able to to take a look at that. You can also purchase it directly from O'Reilly.com. And then for the keynotes, for example, we make available on YouTube for free. Okay, excellent. So when we were first discussing you coming on the show, uh, there was talk of a discount code then, uh, 25% off, I believe. Yes, there is a discount code, and I'm not sure what discount code they specifically gave you, the, the letters that make it happen. But yes, 25% off. Uh, it's definitely a good deal, and I would be happy to see it used by all of your your listeners. Yeah, Linux 25, all one word. is that. That's and uh, also, uh, we'll be giving away a pass, uh, which we'll give some details about uh, in, in a few seconds. But uh, yeah, it sounds like a very interesting event. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on the show and giving us your time. No problem. Thanks a lot. I hope to see a lot of you there. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, it definitely sounds like a very interesting event, and I'd like to go, but um, unfortunately I won't be able to get over to Amsterdam um, in the last week of October. It's just before Og Camp, so I'll be kind of gearing up for that. But we mentioned a giveaway there. Now, O'Reilly have been kind enough to offer a free pass to someone. So if you can make it, to Amsterdam between the 26th and 28th of October, and that means make your own way and make your own accommodation arrangements, then you could be going for free if you want. So all you have to do is email us with the subject line OzCon Pass, and we will select at random a winner, and uh, we will give you a code that you can put in and um, claim your free pass. So uh, yeah, do email us, show at linuxluddites.com with OzCon Pass as the subject line yeah i mean i think we should probably point out this is the most valuable giveaway we've ever had on the show yeah it is because i mean it's uh it's a fairly expensive conference to go to it's it's kind of quite corporate and stuff so yeah it's it, well worth winning this so uh yeah if you're around that area then definitely uh enter it and if you're not lucky enough to be chosen at random then there's also the discount code which is linux 25 which gets you 25 percent off so uh yeah, use that as well. Yeah, so as Joe said, make sure you email us if you're able to make it and it's a sort of area of interest for you. And the closing date is the 17th of October, midnight UK time. Yeah, and we'll contact you to tell you one shortly after that and then we'll announce it on a later show afterwards. But with that then, we're coming to the end of another Linux Luddites. You can email us at show at linuxluddites.com, find us on Twitter or at the Google Plus and Facebook communities or leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Jesse, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again next week for more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Bye all. Bye, Paddy. See you later. <laughs> you can't say bye, Paddy. I can. He's probably the only person who listens to that part through. Probably. Probably.